Okay, good evening, one and all, and welcome to the first in our series, Catholic Higher Education in Light of Catholic Social Thought, a set of four conversations we are hosting that draw from a volume of essays co-edited by tonight's speakers, Bernard Prusak and Jennifer Reed Booley. The book is entitled Catholic Education in Light of Catholic Social Thought, Critical Constructive Essays, and it's forthcoming from Paulus Press later this year. And I wanna congratulate Bernard and Jennifer on this, this, this great success. My name is Michael Murphy and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola Chicago. And I'm coming to you live from one of our many Loyola digital outposts here through the, um, you know, in, as we uh, walk through further together uh, these pandemical times. Um, on behalf of university leadership and on behalf of Gabrielle Buckley, and uh, who's the Ann Ida uh, Gannon Center for Women and Leadership Director, uh, who are co-sponsoring this event. Uh, so on behalf of Gabrielle, I wanna welcome you uh, to our Zoom cast. Uh, I extend a hearty, a hearty greeting as well uh, on behalf of our center staff, Megan Toomey, our, our center manager, Kathleen McNutt, our graduate student assistant, uh, who together with, uh, with me as a team, we, we get all these events from farm, farm to table and I'm really grateful for their help. So thanks uh, Megan and Kathleen again. Um, responding to the signs of the times, uh, this book brings the lens of Catholic social thought, CST, to the enterprise of Catholic higher education in the US. Scandals in the church and the growth of religious non-affiliation in the culture have made being Catholic greatly challenging for Catholic colleges and universities. At the same time that the economics of higher education uh, exacerbated by the coronavirus pandemic have mounted a challenge to the variability and very viability of many institutions. So this book throws, sheds, informs us uh, by shedding light and throwing light on what Catholic colleges and universities might and must do in order to both preserve their mission and renew it for the future. Tonight's event is called uh, A System Adrift, Catholic Social Thought as an Anchor for Catholic Higher Education, uh, and features the anchor text of the volume and its authors and the editors. So Bernard and Jennifer will present for about 30 minutes, and then our colleague here at Loyola, Michael Shook, will provide a response. Now, just some housekeeping before we begin. Uh, first, to put eyes on our next event, which you've already done in, in the waiting room there. So I want to thank Kathleen and Megan for putting that slide up. You see the three other events coming down the line on February 16th, March 2nd, and March 23rd. Three great events on three topics by guests and respondents from Loyola. So you can look at our website for more info there. There's also some other events from the Hank Center that I'd, you know, we'd appreciate you taking a look at. We do a lot of good things. It's our pleasure to do so. And uh, we have a very busy, full and uh, you know, kind of a, a variable uh, potpourri of opportunities for you. So please give us a good look. Just some housekeeping now uh, before we get to it. And really it just has to do with uh, the format of tonight's event. So tonight's Zoomcast, you know, we're all, we're all pros here at Zoom. It's a meeting. And that means that while the chat is, has been limited, uh, we're gonna use it for uh, questions answers and comments. So uh, you'll direct your insights, your questions, your comments to me. So in the, in the chat box, just select Michael Murphy and type away. And I'll be uh, culling and collating and organizing those insights. And I just wanna encourage you, uh, you know, it's, it's always easier to kind of uh, write as you go. So please, if you have a thought, uh, put it in prose and share it and I will organize it and hopefully get to it, right? Um, we have a good turnout here, so I'll do my very best, uh, I promise you. Thank you. So let's now welcome our, our speakers and our respondent. Uh, these are the more abbreviated bios, uh, and please, again, check our web pages for further information. Bernard Prusak is Professor of Philosophy and Founding Director of the McGowan Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility at King's College in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Dr. Prusak's scholarship focuses on, uh, in, pardon me, moral and social philosophy, 
He has published widely in scholarly journals and books on such topics as parental obligations and children's rights, conscience, just war, religious liberty, the moral limits of markets, and the principles of cooperation and double effect. He also writes for Commonweal Magazine, where he worked as an editorial assistant before graduate school, and he also writes for America. Bernard also serves as senior editor for the great journal, Expositions, Interdisciplinary Studies in the Humanities, for which he edits the forum Ethics in Focus. He is a member of the steering committee of Catholic Social Teaching, Learning, and Research Initiative, um, a collaboration of faculty and administrators from Catholic colleges and universities across the US. Welcome, Bernard, and good to see you again. Jennifer Reed Booley is professor and program director of theology at College of St. Mary in Omaha, Nebraska. She earned her PhD in Christian ethics and MA in theology from Loyola University, Chicago. Welcome home, Jennifer. Uh, and she worked with Michael Shook, which is awesome as well. Uh, Jennifer uh, earned her BA from the University of Notre Dame and her article, Challenging Racism and White Privilege in Undergraduate Theology Contexts, Teaching and Learning Strategies for Maximizing the Promise of Community Service Learning. Uh, and we congratulate you on that great article, Jennifer, as well. And that appeared in Teaching Theology and Religion uh, in 2015. The article is so good, I, I, I've seen it. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, article. It was an award winner uh, from the College, the uh, College Theology Society, excuse me, their annual award for best article published in theology. Congrats again, Jennifer. Our respondent, uh, Michael Shook, is professor of theology here at Loyola University, Chicago, and founding director of the Joan and Bill Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage. I wanna thank you again, Mike, for your vision, your work, your imagination, creativity, uh, for uh, founding this great center that's been growing and growing. We stand on your shoulders, my friend. Um, his main research in interests are Roman Catholic social thought with special attention to its history, variety, and relationship to other forms of social thought, both ancient and modern, and really the places in between. So uh, everybody, please welcome uh, our speaker. Jennifer will go first. And without further ado, it's A System Adrift, Catholic Social Thought as an Anchor for Catholic Higher Education. Jennifer, the stage is yours. Great, thank you so much. Bernard and I want to begin by thanking you, Mike, and the Hank Center at Loyola University Chicago for hosting this presentation, as well as the three that will follow on how Catholic social thought can inform the work of Catholic higher education. We also wish to thank Mike Shook for offering to provide the response, as well as thank all of you who are participating in the event this evening. Our title slide features Brian Whelan's Walking on Water. Anyone who has worked for a few years as a faculty or administration at a Catholic college or university likely is familiar with how Catholic social thought, CST, often figures in the life of the institution, namely as a cudgel for faculty to wield against the administration or vice versa. Respect for human dignity, concern for the common good, the preferential option for the poor and vulnerable, and even more obscure principles like subsidiarity crop up in faculty administration disputes over such matters as health insurance coverage, adjunct pay and benefits, hiring decisions, diversity on campus, and more recently, child care and return to work protocols during the pandemic. There is sometimes a whiff of opportunism to these arguments. In those cases, the combatants wield the principles of CST not out of deep commitment, but because they are the principles that the college or university is supposed to observe as a Catholic institution. And shame on you, it is clearly implied for not embodying your commitments. Unfortunately, there can be a measure of truth to that accusation. As Joseph McCartan, who will speak with you in March, has observed, quote, Catholic campuses are increasingly entangled in a larger economy that promotes yawning inequalities, unquote. He points to the so-called gigification of teaching positions as tenure lines devolve into contingent semester to semester appointments. The subcontracting of auxiliary services such as feeding students 
to for-profit corporations with checkered records in labor law and extravagant executive pay, and the vigorous opposition to unionization by more than a few institutions which is ironic against the background of Pope Leo XIII's 1891 encyclical Rero Novarum, affirming the right to form, quote, working men's associations for helping each individual member to better his condition to the utmost in body, soul, and property, unquote. Others have drawn critical attention to investment and licensing practices, which may entangle Catholic colleges and universities in exploitative supply chains and earth degrading industries. While that picture is not pretty, it also is not the whole story. For example, McCartan points to Georgetown University's just employment policy, mandating that all campus workers be paid a living wage. And he notes that several institutions, including Georgetown, Fordham University, and St. Louis University, did not oppose, but even welcome the formation of adjunct faculty unions. Consider further the University of Dayton's board-driven decision to divest from fossil fuels, anticipating by a year Pope Francis's landmark 2015 encyclical on care for our common home, Laudato Si. Finally, experiments like Arupe College, a Jesuit community college associated, as you know, with Loyola University Chicago, put flesh on the commitment to serve the marginalized. Catholic social thought is by no means alien to the operations of all Catholic colleges and universities. Instead, it might well be the case that in some instances, institutions do not appreciate sufficiently how they are in fact living out CST through what they do day in, day out. For example, through the particular population of students they serve or through the local community they support. Even before the pandemic, however, scandals in the church and the growth of religious non-affiliation in the culture had made being Catholic greatly challenging for Catholic colleges and universities. Now the pandemic has only exacerbated the already fragile economics of higher education, mounting a threat to the very viability of many institutions, just as the numbers of traditional college-age students have begun, begun to decline significantly across the US. It is a vast understatement that these are trying times for American Catholic higher education. The title of our presentation alludes to Peter Steinfeld's 2003 book, A People Adrift, The Crisis of the Roman Catholic Church in America, which itself alludes to the story in the Synoptic Gospels of Jesus rebuking and quelling a violent storm that threatened to capsize the boat he and his disciples had boarded to cross the Sea of Galilee. Jesus has fallen asleep. Terrified of drowning, the disciples wake him for help. It is not unthinkable or even unlikely that a number of Catholic colleges and universities will go under, so to speak, as a result of the pandemic. The crisis that Steinfels depicted in 2003 has new untold dimensions. It would be naive to believe that Catholic social thought is the means of salvation but we propose that CST might help to anchor Catholic colleges and universities as they seek to weather the times or as they rebuild in the pandemic's wake. In particular, CST might help to anchor Catholic colleges and universities in their missions as distinctively Catholic institutions. Though the pandemic will not allow us to remake our social world from scratch, it does present an opportunity to examine whether the quote unquote old normal was sustainable, desirable, or for Catholic institutions adequately faithful to Christ. Responding to the signs of the times, our presentation and the three that follow in the Hank Center series bring the lens of Catholic social thought to the enterprise of Catholic higher education in the US. Our project's aim is to stimulate and support discussion of contemporary challenges and opportunities in Catholic higher ed in light of CST. And I'm so glad that all of you are joining us to engage in this conversation this evening. The Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities proposes in its 2012 vision statement on Catholic higher education and Catholic social teaching that CST should be incorporated into quote, all aspects of institutional life, unquote, including employment policies, environmental practices, and finances. Toward the goal of making the ACCU's vision a reality, we want to consider the opportunities and challenges CST presents for Catholic institutions to differentiate themselves from other colleges and universities, while at the same time preserving and advancing their missions and responsibilities.
responding to current challenges in the church and world. We use the T in CST to stand for thought, but it also may stand for teaching or tradition. CST is a living, dynamic tradition that advances a vision of social justice, of right relations in social life on our common home, mother and sister earth, expressed and developed through magisterial teaching, scholarship, and the lived experiences of faithful Catholics and other people of goodwill. CST includes key principles such as respect for human dignity, concern for the common good, the preferential option for the poor and vulnerable, care for creation, solidarity, and subsidiarity. But those principles, while oft cited, do not exhaust CST, which draws upon scripture, the natural law tradition, Catholicism's rich symbols and sacramental imagination, the lives of holy women and men, and a complex theological anthropology. In brief, CST is about social justice and social justice has to do with social action, the reorganization of the social systems in which people live and work. It is a basic premise of our project that what makes a college or university Catholic includes not only the curriculum and the faculty, but also the particular lens that the institution employs in conducting its business. A college or university with its brick and mortar campus might appear to be a massive alien object indifferent and impervious to the wishes and projects of its current generation of students, faculty, and staff, much as the natural world is set over and against its present flora and fauna. In support of this vision, as anyone who has served on a core curriculum committee knows well, change normally comes quite solely in higher education. Otherwise, liberal faculty can be remarkably conservative in some respects. Nonetheless, we are convinced that as the historian and former college president Francis Oakley has claimed, quote, institutional life is a fragile social construct, a frail tissue of human purpose, intentionality, aspiration, and hope, unquote. From this perspective, the nature of an institution is never a given. It is always being shaped and reshaped by the ways in which its leaders, whether trustees, administrators, or faculty, define, proclaim, and embody the institution's purposes and values. The days in which it could be taken for granted that a college or university was Catholic because its leaders were vowed religious are coming to an end if they are not over already. As Vatican II urged, the laity's apostolate must now be, quote, broadened and intensified, unquote, if the institutions that they lead are to go on being Catholic in meaningful ways. But this new reality brings new challenges. For example, for the selection, education, and formation of boards of trustees who increasingly come from the very top of the income ladder. While we await a comprehensive study of boards of trustees of Catholic colleges and universities, recent research suggests that the education of boards in the mission and identity of Catholic colleges and universities tends to be thin, and the readiness of boards to bring Catholic mission and identity to bear on matters of policy cannot be taken for granted. The situation is hardly better for lay administrators and faculty whose formation for leadership roles is seldom given nearly the attention accorded to vowed religious. As Steinfels remarked, the upshot is that lay leaders arrive, quote, with new questions, but increasingly without old knowledge that vowed religious brought to the task. Now I'd like to turn over the rest of the presentation to Bernard. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I joked that this was to be our intermission time, but I'm going to bring this quickly to a close. That's my job. So give me one sec. Let us conclude this presentation then with a fuller account of CST. More precisely, what seeking to live it out might look like for a given institution in our challenging times. Consider as a case study the issue of childcare, which as we remarked earlier, has arisen with urgency in the context of the pandemic. Working parents, as you know, are scrambling as their children's schools open only online or adopt a hybrid model combining some days of in-person instruction with some days of online instruction, or offer instruction, whether in-person or online, only two or three days per week, if that. Childcare is expensive and frankly frightening when the threat of infection is high. 
Who wants to send his child off to daycare when it has been judged too risky for schools to open? And who wants to open her home to a caregiver who might prove to be a carrier of the virus? In any event, as we know, some parents can afford neither. Historically, and to this day, childcare responsibilities have disproportionately fallen on women. During the last 100 years in the United States, women made great gains in combining family and work, or in other words, children and careers. The economist Claudia Golden warns, however, that the increased burden from school closings could erase years of gains by young women. Once more in her words, quote, the COVID economy has magnified gender differences at work and at home, end quote. Because couple equity is expensive for the family unit, it limits couples career choices or raises the cost of childcare or poses opportunity costs for family life. For example, no piano lessons if no parent can take the child to the lessons. Golden expects that men will go back to work full-time and revert to what she calls BCE, before coronavirus era childcare levels, while women's careers by and large probably will be set back. The data so far suggests just that. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in September 2020, more than 1.1 million people over the age of 20 stopped looking for work. Women made up 80% of those 1.1 million, around 865,000. For colleges and universities, the effects will be seen in the population of professors and the future of academic leadership. What's more, it should be noted that the typical obstacles faced by students who are mothers have become even more daunting. Providing for their children through paid employment was already a lot. Now they often must provide some education too, lest their children fall behind. Magisterial teaching is shot through with gender essentialism and sexism about the proper place of women. But there are countervailing principles that cut against the non-starter position that mothers sim simply should stay home, which often is neither desirable nor feasible in our economy. First, and thankfully, the equal dignity of all persons, whether male, female, or gender non-conforming, is a given in Catholic thought Though, as you know, the church is quite divided about how to respond to the LGBTQ plus movement. Second, there is what is called the principle of participation, which figures prominently in counts of CST. Consider, as a way to put flesh on this principle, participation in a classroom. Class participation is both a duty and a right, and it seems plausible to argue that the right to participate is grounded in the duty to do so which might be unpacked as a duty to contribute to the common good that is the class. Imagine, though, that the teacher refuses to call on you, or that, on account of systemic prejudice against you because of your gender, race, or ethnicity, your contributions are brushed aside and discounted. You are the victim of what philosophers call epistemic injustice. You've been wronged in your capacity as a knowing subject. In that context, it makes sense to construe your right to participate as a claim right that you hold over and against others who owe you better. Otherwise, you are not accorded the respect that you do as a person, and you are blocked from developing yourself as a student and as an educated member of our society. In the context of CST, the principle of participation is the name for the claim right people have based on their dignity as children of God, not to be excluded from the means of developing themselves or as it is often put, fulfilling themselves as human beings. In the US political context, we might compare the April 2020 ruling by the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit that public school children have a constitutional right protected by the 14th Amendment to an education that plausibly enables them to become literate. In CST, the focus falls on participation in the economy, and a key document is Pope John Paul II's 1991 encyclical Centissimus Annus, published 100 years after Rerum Novarum. Pope John Paul observes that, quote, and this is a long quotation, many people, perhaps the majority today, do not have the means which would enable them to take their place in an effective and humanly dignified way within a productive system in which work is truly central to human fulfillment as it has become in contemporary economies. 
they have no possibility of acquiring the basic knowledge which would enable them to express their creativity and to develop their potential. They have no way of entering the network of knowledge and intercommunication, which would enable them to see their qualities appreciated and utilized. Thus, if not actually exploited, they are to a great extent marginalized. Economic development takes place over their heads, so to speak, when it does not actually reduce the already narrow scope of their old subsistence economies." End quote. Such an economy of exclusion, as it's termed, facilitates and is an expression of what Pope Francis calls a throwaway culture, which regards the masses of people excluded and marginalized without work, without possibilities, without any means of escape as mere leftovers of a bygone age whose well-being is a matter of general indifference. According to CST, however, work is more than a way to make a living. It's a form of continuing participation in God's creation. And as such, access to work that enables one both to make a living and to realize oneself, like access to a basic education, is a right of each and every human being whom the creator has called into being. In brief, work is a pro-life issue. Yet several qualifications are in order. To begin with, the right to work is not, of course, absolute. Like other rights, it is held in a network of duties to respect not only other people's rights and duties, but the integrity of the natural world. Work must be both just and sustainable. Further, and yet more to the point, a right to work is inert. It does nothing for no one, both if work is not available and if the obligation to provide it falls on no one or no body in particular. The right to work is dependent on social structures and institutional frameworks. A society must organize itself to make work available and people with social and other forms of capital must see themselves as obligated to provide it. In other words, if there is a right to work as CST holds there is, satisfying it is a matter of social justice properly speaking. It demands social action, which is to say the collaboration and sometimes creation of groups and bodies and institutions that take it on themselves to bring about systemic change. Pope Pius XI illustrates this point. In his 1931 encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, issued 40 years after Rerum Novarum, Pius remarks, quote, every effort must be made that fathers of families receive a wage large enough to meet ordinary family needs adequately. But if this cannot always be done under existing circumstances, social justice demands that changes be introduced as soon as possible, whereby such a wage will be assured to every adult working man." End quote. Beyond the blatant sexism, what warrants attention here is the implicit distinction Pius draws between so-called commutative justice, which has to do with right, right relations between individuals, like an employer and an employee, and social justice, which demands systemic change so that individual relations can be right. On this account, the duty to work for social justice is a duty to engage in social action with the aim of righting injustices that solely by ourselves, we are hopeless to overcome. If there is to be effective change, it must be at the systemic level of institutions. New norms and sets of rules, likely requiring new social structures with new positions and roles must be developed to reorganize social interactions. In that light then, let us return to the issue of childcare in the context of the pandemic. Are Catholic colleges and universities duty bound to accommodate employees with school aged children at home, for example, by permitting faculty in need to teach online? Given the principle of participation, as well as Catholicism's commitment to the goodness of procreation and family life, which follows from the basic faith commitment to the goodness of creation, it might appear that such a course of action is indeed mandatory. But let us imagine that at a particular college or university, maybe yours, resources are quite tight. Moreover, the great majority of students and the great majority of tuition paying parents of students want instruction to be in person rather than principally online. Finally, competition for students among comparable colleges and universities is fierce. Would it be unjust for the administration to reject faculty demands for accommodation? It might be unwise to do so without first exploring creative alternatives. Further, perhaps it would be feasible to grant a limited number of requests for the cases of greatest need. If so, an institution that takes its Catholic identity to heart should grant those requests. 
But the availability of high quality, affordable childcare is not a problem that any one college or university can solve. The availability of childcare is a social problem, the solution to which requires social action. Claudia Golden claims that what we need in this regard is no less than good government, which might institute programs like those of the Works Progress Administration in the Great Depression. Note that on this account, CST is no mere cudgel for faculty to wield against the administration or vice versa. Instead, CST is a means to clarify and elaborate the moral stakes of the issue at hand, here the issue of childcare, where what is at stake is, is participation in meaningful work and the fulfillment and financial security that it brings. The broader point is that the various principles of CST do not yield simple answers or dictate solutions. More critically, they raise, frame, and provide substantive terms to discuss and deal with morally fraught questions. To that end, CST foregrounds the social context, more fully the socio-political economic context, in which Catholic colleges and universities operate. It demands both that we reckon with the constraints imposed by that context and that we see institutions as potential agents of social change and sometimes perhaps as obstacles, especially if they or their leaders benefit from the current order. Socio-politico economic constraints are not, however, an excuse for inaction. They do not provide cover for quiescence. As Pius XI wrote in his 1937 encyclical, Divini Redemptoris, where it is true that there are obstacles to justice, it is a duty to seek creative ways to overcome those obstacles. Affronts to social justice require social action to which Catholic colleges and universities may be positioned to contribute. By way of example, and to bring this to a close, College of St. Mary, CSM, a women's university in Omaha, Nebraska, at which Jennifer teaches, elected to allocate some of its CARES Act funding for expenses incurred because of the pandemic to establishing in August 2020 an on-campus kids club as a response to local school districts' decisions to teach fully online or in a hybrid plan. 15 CSM undergraduates, under the guidance of a full-time director, provide supervised tutoring, computer help for online classes, and activities for kindergarten through sixth grade children during the days that they are not physically in school. CSM offers the program every weekday from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. About 40 children participate in the program which requires registration, masks, social distancing, and daily temperature checks. Because about 10% of CSM students are single mothers for whom safe childcare is difficult to secure and may be prohibitively expensive, the program is essential to the university's mission to empower women to complete their education. It also allows faculty and staff with children to continue to provide in-person instruction and support to students at CSM rather than choose to leave the workforce in order to attend to their children's education. It remains to be seen if the Kids Club will be sustainable, but it is an example of an institution creatively seeking to ensure, in accord with its mission and CST, that people can pursue meaningful work. Future presentations in this series will extend and deepen these reflections with respect to other challenges and opportunities now before US Catholic colleges and universities. You'll hear from Laura Nichols, Associate Professor of, so of Sociology at Santa Clara on the structural factors affecting the demographics of our student bodies. From Joseph McCartan, Professor of History at Georgetown University on labor policies and problems. And from Catherine Punsalan Manimos, Assistant to the President for Mission Integration at University of Detroit Mercy on women's and lay leadership. Thank you for your attention. And we look forward now to Mike Shook's response. Uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer and Bernard. It's really a privilege to have this opportunity to, to join you in your kind of vigilant pursuit of identity with integrity for Roman Catholic colleges and universities and the role that uh, Catholic, Catholic social teaching can play in that pursuit. And you give a really helpful sample of, of the CTS, uh, CST uh, principles and um, 
that are available to Catholic colleges and universities as they reach for or try to sustain an authentic uh, Catholic identity. Uh, and I want to thank you for opening that cornucopia to us of, of everything from that you ended there with the CSM kids clubs and Bernard, um, the child care discussion is really rich and, and thought provoking. Um, so I want to thank you for opening that up for us. I, I, um, I, I really was, have been reflecting the last few days, reading your, you know, reading your paper and also just thinking about about you now, Bernard. I don't. I don't know you, but I know Jennifer quite well, and I can't read this paper without thinking about Jennifer. And I know I'm going to embarrass her, but uh, that your embarrassment will come a little bit later. Uh, but a thought did occur to me when I was reading the paper, and and um, it it's not like anything that all of you don't know. It's more like the stones that are. I've just turned the kaleidoscope, and they've just rearranged a little bit for me. Uh, so fo follow me on this and see if it has any bearing on, on your discussion. So I think it's safe to say that like thousands of people who have made their known and unknown contributions to modern Catholic social thought since the 18th century, the majority of them, I have to believe, lived in lay religious or mixed intentional communities, uh, that is residential communities of men and women, and in some cases uh, with children that were designed uh, for living together, sharing community tasks, pooling income. Now, obviously religious orders of men and women uh, are, are examples here, uh, but of course you have to think of the lay institutes of brothers and the, you know, the obviously the Catholic worker uh, but I think there's really an unwritten history of intentional faith communities of families, of Catholic families living together and sharing tasks and resources. Um, and I think this has been, this has been an, um, uh, something that has been evident through the 19th century in Europe and also in the, in the history of American Catholicism. Um, so I would say then with the exception of the Catholic worker and a few others, the, the, then the, the experiences of living in these kinds of organized communities have not really been made an explicit resource for reflection on the, on the principles and actions uh, that are recommended in Catholic social thought. You know, I can't, for instance, I can't think of a line in John Courtney Murray's writings where he ever kind of reflected on what living in a community of men sharing meals, praying together, pooling resources, you know, um, how that might have impacted his perception of, of community or human dignity or the principles that he drew on in this, his uh, voluminous reflections on, on Catholic social teaching. And, you know, I can't think of a, of a single encyclical where a Pope kind of did it aside and, and, and talked about his, his own experience of living in an intentional community and how that bore witness to a principle or an op op observation that he was making in the text. Um, but I, I, I just have to believe, you know, wouldn't it defy common sense to imagine that this context um, had no bearing on their thoughts or, had, or was not kind of covertly operating? Um, so CTS, uh, you know, it's possible uh, even as strong as the explicit questions and articles of Aquinas' Summa, you know, there again, you read the Summa, you, Aquinas is never talking about the, his experience of community living and how that might have some bearing on how he reads Aristotle. Uh, if you extracted, um, but I wonder if, you know, we have the principle of the sociality of the person, you know, the, the person as a political animal, the principle of the person as a social being, as an abstract principle that comes through Aristotle and we kind of, uh, we, we imbibe in that. But if you extracted Thomas's lived experience of communal living, uh, you know, with the same kind of communitarian meaning of that phrase, you know, transfer into Catholic social teaching, uh, so do we take this kind of non-conscious or unconscious existential communitarianism, uh, you know, maybe we could take it as an undertone 
uh, throughout the majority of the texts that, that constitute Catholic social teaching, um, maybe as some kind of imperceptible more uh, to the principle of the common good or to the principle of rights or to the principle of freedom uh, that is not Rawls common good, right? And it's not Rousseau's common good. Uh, so I'm gonna, I, I mentioned undertone, I'm, I'll use another musical metaphor. I'm gonna say this is um, Catholic social theory in the key of C that is uh, in the key of co intentional community. And intentional community that's um, premised on mutual care, shared resources, divine love. The context that I think the majority of the people that created this material were coming out of, but didn't necessarily directly talk about. Now, you know, Marx and Mill and Foucault and Bordeaux and Habermas and Rawls, they're all social theorists and ethicists of the highest order, but none of them played their social wisdom in the key of C. And, and Catholic social thought does that. It's an elusive quality. It can't be put into a, um, a, a syllogism. It's not necessarily kind of communicated in a concrete principle. There's something there's an elusive communitarianism to this. And, 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 and may we, you know, may we dare say that is, a, that is an echo of um, our, our communal lives, particularly the communal lives of, of people that lived in uh, pool, you know, communities of pooled resources and intentional sharing. Um, but, and I, I guess the point here is that I, you know, that's where, to me, uh, Bernard's point about using Catholic social teaching as a shaming device. I mean, pe people that use Catholic social teaching as a shaming device are not using it in the key of C, right? Um, uh, people that use it as a cudgel, they're not using it in the key of C. They're, they're, they're out of tune. Um, and when, when, a, when a university uses Catholic social teaching as a rhetorical flourish for a Catholic University market, marketing campaign. I mean, that, that is completely out of tune. So, um, and, and, and then maybe some of you have had this experience where you can find yourself in this anomalous situation where a secular university is playing its social ethical principles in the key of C and the Catholic institution that you're familiar with uh, that promotes Catholic social teaching is not playing it in the key of C at all. Um, now, now, that may not be, I mean, that may be anomalous, but, you know, there was Jesus at, at the well, so anomaly is part of, you know, part of our, our reality. So um, maybe, uh, you know, to play Catholic social teaching in the key of C, you have to start uh, and I'm sounding very apodictic here, but maybe you have to start with a felt intention um, that maybe never appears on the surface, but it's an intentionality of relinquishment, you know, uh, that, that kind of giving up and giving away, that uh, giving over, you know, narcissistic egoism, giving over greed, giving over cynicism, self-righteous cleverness, all these acids that eat away at the life of communal living, uh, uh, eat away at teamwork, eat away at pooled income uh, projects, acids that um, would really eat away at the undertone of Catholic social teaching. And, and you know, the undertone that allows Catholic social teaching to give Catholic institutions its authentic identity, right? authentic identity. Now, in my experience, uh, uh, and I, th I thought of this kind of bridge too. In my experience, many students are very interested in participating and even forming intentional communities. And, and intentional communities dedicated to social justice. And, and I was just checking the, the US, the Foundation for Intentional Communities in the United States, which registers about 100,000 intentional communities in the United States. In the last 10 years, the number has doubled. 
The millennials are, uh, there's a, a rising interest in um, the millennial population and younger in, in the kind of authenticity of, of, of intentional communities. And maybe some of you in the classroom have, have had that experience. And, and on a, I feel like I experienced that same thing at, at Standing Rock when I was when thousands of people were pouring into this place in nowhere in North Dakota, hungry for an intentional community, a shared experience that that was a pro, that was the promotion of justice. Uh, and it seems to me that were Catholic colleges and universities to tap into this living undertone of Catholic social teaching through intentional community education, intentional community curricula, intentional community workshops, intentional community education, then I think that the principles of Catholic social thought would start to sing, right, in the university. Um, now here's where Jennifer gets embarrassed, but you know, I knew Jennifer, um, you know, when she came to Loyola Air these, you know, many years ago. And, uh, you know, you could sense that Jennifer was already at a place <laughs> in her formation where a real Catholic social teaching could be, could be birthed. She, you know, she, you could tell there was a sensibil sensibility of relinquishment, of, you know, of relinquish relinquishment of, of narcissism, of greed, that there was incredible generosity in sharing with her peers, uh, her other graduate students, that there she was tapping into, I think, and, and other students that have come down the pike, tapping into a, a real stream of uh, that, that undertone of communitarianism that is what gives life to these principles. Um, and so, so I would say, you know, she was already singing in the key of C. And when she learned Catholic social teaching, it was hand in glove. And she, and look, she spent her life uh, and her career in this. And I, and I suspect that with Bernard, it's a similar story. So, um, you know, I'm not sure if Catholic colleges and universities need an anchor uh, in Catholic social teaching. I. I think what they surely need is people who can sing in the key of C. And, and, and I thank Jennifer and Bernard for, for their singing tonight. Well, let's hear it, everybody. That's a wonderful uh, discussion uh, that's not linked yet, but it will be linked momentarily. I usually go right to questions, but I, because Michael Shook has uh, entered uh, some new nomenclature of deep interest to me. Uh, we play guitar and banjo together a couple times, <laughs> but it's the key of C. And I just think Bernard and Jennifer should uh, have a chance to respond to that kind of, that central kind of sea change feeling that, uh, that almost um, challenges the, the anchor metaphor that you're working with. So how about some brief thoughts on that, Jennifer and Bernard? Sure, well, I'll start. Um, first of all, Mike, thanks so much for your response. And I wasn't expecting a public to publicly be um, embarrassed in this or um, complimented. So thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really grateful for your mentorship while I was at Loyola and also for your continued scholarship on communitarianism as the undertone of Catholic social thought and uh, helping us to remember that it's not only about papal documents and bishops documents, but it's about the lived experiences of lay people, vowed religious, et cetera, both individually and families and social movements, et cetera. So thank you for that. Um, with regard to how the communitarian undertone and the key of C, and I, I really appreciate that metaphor, might affect the way that we think about our work I think that what that might do is help us to focus on how are Catholic colleges and universities already living out this ethos of communitarianism. And as I mentioned very briefly in my introductory comments, but might not even be sufficiently aware of how they are living mm -hmm. that out and might not be articulating it in terms of Catholic identity and mission. So I think a basic premise of our project is that all of the Catholic colleges and universities 
are doing their best to live out their identity and mission. And that looks really different in lots of different institutions. Um, but that perhaps our book and the discussions that we have will help us to articulate more clearly how those are associated with our mission and identity in terms of Catholic social thought. Thank you. Uh, Bernard, do you have a thought on that? I'm not sure it could be as articulate as Jennifer's. I think that was well put. Uh, Mike, it's an interesting question though, which, which, uh, you know, which, which metaphor um, you know, might take us further, let's say. So we went with the metaphor of the, the anchor and the allusion to Peter Steinfels's book, um, The System Adrift, as, as opposed to a people adrift. But it's an interesting suggestion. I, I, uh, I, I you know, simply will echo Jennifer's point that um, you know, it, probably the case that uh, in, in many ways our, our institutions already are acting consistent with CST, already embodying it, already singing in the key of C, as you put it. Um, but very often um, we don't have adequate language, I think, or perhaps insight into what we're most deeply about. Um, and as Jennifer suggests, perhaps one contribution of, of our, our project might be uh, you know, greater, greater clarity about, um, about you know, just what the mission of, of Catholic higher education is in the United States. So obviously that's a rather uh, am ambitious aim, but maybe we can throw some further light on that question. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Bernard. Uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna contextualize a little bit and move to some other communities within the college and university kind of matrix. So here's a pair of thoughts. They're related, but not quite, not exactly similar. Uh, this is from Regina Haney. What um, what old knowledge do board members need to carry on the mission of colleges and universities? That's one side of the thought. The other side of the thought comes from Christopher White. How can we help faculty at Catholic colleges and universities prioritize CST when it conflicts with their personal interests? Who wants to take a stab at that one? Bernard, do you want to start on that one? <laughs> Which of the two? So <laughs> let, me, let me scribble a little bit about that second one. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a... Uh, I'll, I'll begin with that question about uh, boards. Um, you know, we have to be careful here not to you know, speak too generally, right? And to make too many state general statements about boards of trustees since uh, they look quite different at each and every institution I, ima I imagine. We can make some general claims. And if anybody's interested, I wrote a paper um, a few years back in the Journal of Catholic Higher Education on boards of trustees 50 years after uh, the, the movement to incorporate colleges and universities separately from founding. Uh, Bernard, I'm gonna ask you for that paper and people uh, check back in uh, with the recording and you can read that paper. Sure, all right, but it's a good question. What, what old knowledge do board members need? Uh, well, one answer, but only one answer. And again, it's a very good question is that um, you know, board members need, or we think would benefit from greater knowledge of the tradition of Catholic social thought. So it's one dimension of, of the Catholic intellectual tradition. I, I think we've got to emphasize CST does belong to the Catholic intellectual tradition for sure. Uh, it doesn't exhaust it, uh, but, but it's rooted within it. So I think, um, you know, board members could well benefit from, from a much more intentional introduction to CST uh, as they join the board and throughout uh, their service on the board as well. I, I don't suggest though, let me be clear that you know, board members need to know CST because then they would make um, you know, much better decisions and then they would, they would uh, direct Catholic colleges in ways much more consistent with Catholic identity. That might well be the case. Um, but I don't want to be saying that, you know, um, 
otherwise boards would lead us all astray. What, what Jennifer and I are, are suggesting, and now please piggyback here, Jennifer, or correct for that matter, is that uh, you know, CST, one function of CST is to raise questions that uh, might otherwise not be raised, is to provide uh, substantive terms with which to discuss those questions, uh, to frame those questions in ways that, that could support conversation across the institution, conversation as well within the board. From my you know, research of boards of, of trustees, what, what I found is that there's very little introduction of Catholic social thought to boards. Uh, there's very, there's very little. At least the institutions I studied, there's, there's very little um, time taken to tell new board members these are principles that you should know. These are principles that might make a difference in the kinds of questions you might ask. These are principles that might make a difference in the kinds of conversations we might have. Sometimes boards do learn about CST. But it's generally just because you know so and so might have raised some question, maybe a priest in particular, and referenced CST. Um, there's there's generally no discussion up front with board members, uh, and again, generally, I don't want to claim that's true of all institutions about these principles. So that'd be one answer to that question: What old knowledge do board members need? We'd say you know, what we're trying to do with our project. And one audience for our project precisely is members of boards of trustees. All right, Jennifer, I went on much longer than I, I had uh, planned, so please. Oh, that was really helpful, thank you. And I would just add with regard to faculty, um, I, as I take the question, it's how can faculty prioritize Catholic social thought when it might conflict with their personal interests? In my experience, I don't, I haven't seen that it so much conflicts with personal interests as that for faculty who are outside of philosophy and theology, there might be a reticence to engage in discussions of Catholic social thought because it's not the person's disciplinary specialization. And so people want to be careful about not um, going outside of their own expertise. Uh, one, uh, one of my interests is how can Catholic social thought, and here I'm talking not only about principles, but I'm also talking about the lives of holy women and men, let's say the founder or foundress of the order that sponsors the institution, um, in Mike's, you know, going back to Mike's discussion of the communitarian impulse, the uh, lived communities and experiences who've really put flesh on all of this, but my interest is how could faculty, let's say in non-theology or philosophy class that isn't explicitly about Catholic social thought, how can we use the background of Catholic social thought to frame the way that we teach? So what implications does it have for our pedagogy? And I think it really has significant implications, particularly as we're talking about diversity and inclusion of students of color, of underrepresented students, of students who may be first generation students. So we might think about, let's say the principle of option for the poor, which would say that we should put a disproportionate attention on the experiences and um, thoughts of those who have been historically and currently undervalued so that uh, it would, it would uh, implicate that the faculty member should create the kind of learning community in which every student's voice is really welcomed and not just welcomed in theory, but that there are skills and strategies to try to elicit the voices of those who might not feel as comfortable, let's say, speaking up in a class discussion. So it seems to me that Catholic social thought has a lot of implications that are underdeveloped as of yet, even for the way in which we conduct our classes. And I've just given an example of classroom dynamics, but the same could be developed for our choice of resources, who is the author of the texts that we say are normative for the canon, um, et cetera. So that would just be a little snippet of a response to that question, and I thank you for it. Thank you, Jennifer. Michael Shook, do you have any thoughts on that? Um. You have experience with working with boards, I think, a little bit. 
Well, you'll notice uh, Jennifer's response there on pedagogy, which you know is about a, sh a participatory pedagogy, a sharing pedagogy, a co-learning pedagogy. Well, <laughs> you know that started with Jennifer. You know that, that impulse. Um, it, you know it's hard to kind of parachute into a person's head. I mean, that's something that, that um, needs time to incubate. And I don't know any other way to incubate it than to have the old fashioned retreats. You know, I know, you know, years ago, you'd go out on a weekend and you'd hate it because you think I finally got a weekend free from this place. I have to go out and retreat. But then, you know, by this, by the second day, you're, you're, you're interacting with your colleagues in a way you never have before. And there's issues coming up that you've never talked to or talked about one another. So I, I think it's got to be really concrete. And going back to the board of trustees, you know, get those folks on retreat. Um, and, and don't call a retreat like something you do in a day. It, it's formation. And I don't know how else you can do it other than through that experiential, the experience of sharing uh, and, and reflecting like under, under really good guidance. People blanch at, or, or it seems to me, Michael, do you, that people don't like the word formation so much anymore. It seems to be uh, uh, infringing on people's agency. Have you found that to be the case? Come, come well, I don't know. Me. Let's ask uh, Bernard and, and Jack. Yeah. That. I'm just, I don't, I, I leave it there for just an, an observation. Let, let's get to, I have loads and loads of questions, you guys. So let me, let me just uh, do another pairing here that are, that are uh, related. Here's one from uh, Christine Farr. Uh, Given that many older alumni are not very familiar with Catholic social teaching and sometimes see our efforts, and I think she's talking about professors perhaps, they sometimes see our efforts to honor social justice, particularly with regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion as us not being Catholic with a capital C, but catering rather to those who are not Catholic. So that's one, uh, and the other one's this. This is a little longer, but if you could kind of jot down a thought on this, uh, I think you'll see the pairing. This is from Dr. Randy Hetherington from University of Portland. And he writes this, there seem to be external societal forces that are sometimes quietly and sometimes not so quietly seeking to suppress, maybe too strong a word he says, or limit outward Catholic speech, practices and expressions of faith by university faculty and staff, particularly at student events or in classes. He goes on to say the origin of these uh, efforts appear to be non-Catholic students expressing that they feel this is exclusive and inequitable, um, even though they choose to be there. So he says he's sensitive to, to all parties, um, but uh, wonders about this kind of fragile uh, dichotomy of populations that seem to be characterizing many of our uh, universities. So any thoughts on that? Jennifer, let's start with you this time. Okay, I mean, yeah. I'll give it my best shot. Yeah. So uh, I see why you paired these. They're helpful, it's a helpful pairing in terms of the multiple audiences and the multiple constituents that Catholic colleges and universities are serving simultaneously. Um, alums, students, faculty, et cetera. Um, with regard to the first question about alums perhaps seeing diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, efforts as kind of catering to non-Catholics as opposed to being an expression of Catholic identity, I guess um, I can see how that could happen, but I can also see how a uh, program of education could help those alums see that though the official Catholic social teaching has not been as progressive on issues of racial justice as it has been, let's say, on issues of economic justice. And we have a long ways to go in terms of both our teaching and our action as Catholic universities on uh, issues of racism, systemic injustice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I guess we could point, though, to the hopeful strands that we can find in both the documentary tradition as well as in, again, going back to what Mike Shook said, uh, the lived experiences of so many different Catholic lay groups, et cetera. So I think that that issue could be resolved if the alums were open to 
some kind of dialogue and further education about how this really truly is consistent with Catholic identity and mission. In, in fact, it's a key component of living our Catholic identity and mission. Um, Bernard, do you want to add to that and take the second one? I was looking at my phone. We were uh, emailed the second question, so I might have to look at my phone again in order to answer it. Uh, may I say just very briefly, Jennifer, about um, diversity. Now, you know, there's a chapter in, in our book, and actually two chapters in, in the book we're editing uh, on this question. It's, I think, crucially important for uh, Catholic colleges and universities. Let me just say, I, I think it's a, a great question for us, Catholic colleges and universities, to articulate the value of diversity uh, within our Catholic mission. So I think that's a, a key challenge that Catholic colleges and universities ought to take as a challenge. So I'm hearing from, from Christine, we've got alum saying, ah, you're just you know, following the latest trends and trying to diversify your student body. I, I think we got to hear that challenge and say, okay, this is what you're suggesting already, Jennifer. Let's articulate just why uh, diversity and inclusion really are central to our Catholic mission. I think there's work to be done there. I don't think it's work that's been done. I think it's important work to be done and a real opportunity as well for Catholic colleges and universities there to be, I think, uh, on the, the growing edge, so to speak, of, of the church. All right, uh, that other question. So give me a sec here. I'm gonna, as you're reading, I'm gonna say out loud a, another question that you can weave in from Jane Engelke. Wait a minute, that's not helping Mike. All right. <laughs> It'll be, so, I, think it's, I think it's similar, but it's how does the church's marginalization of women, uh, how, how can it marginalize women and then um, ask for credibility when it speaks about social justice? That, those concerns. All right, well, we, thankfully, we also have a chapter on women's and lay leadership. And Catherine uh, Punzalan Monlimos was among us uh, at least a few minutes ago. I'm not going to go through all the TV screens. <laughs> She'll be presenting uh, to the Hank Center on that question. Uh, geez, good one. As a father of, of two daughters, um, it's one that I grapple with in our, our household. Um, were you trying to help me, Mike, and throwing that new question into the mix while I read this one full paragraph? I don't know. I'm just I'm trying to text her. I, I mean, I'm, I wasn't trying to, to handicap or, or kneecap you, as it were. Um, <laughs> I do uh, one sec. Or throw you any any peccadillos in your in your path, but um, I, I do. I think there's connections to these. Yeah. Uh, let me you know, let me just try to tackle that 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 other question. Um, and I, I think it speaks to the question that you just introduced too. Um, you know, look, you know, Jennifer and I said at the beginning, CST is not like you know the solution to all our problems, right? I mean, it's naive to think CST is our salvation. Ah, oh, we've got this great body. And if I hear again that CST is the best kept secret of the church, um, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. But it just, <laughs> I don't want to hear that ever again. Um, yeah, it's an important dimension and element of our of our intellectual tradition. I, I, I've held workshops with our faculty. Our faculty you know, may or may not be Catholic, meaning the faculty members who come to the workshops may or may not be Catholic. CST gives you uh, substantive terms, one more time, uh, with which to discuss really important questions in our colleges and universities and in our society. So, um, you know, you can talk about women's and lay leadership within our institutions, and you're not going to come away feeling all that great. You're going to come away feeling like, geez, there's a lot of work for our institutions to do, and geez, the church has got a lot to learn from American society on this particular point. Um, you know, and to, to the point, I think it's a question from somebody at the University of Portland, that um, expression of, of Catholic identity sometimes not, might not be welcome at, at, at the institution. Well, again, one, one advantage or benefit better of, of CST, of talking about these quite you know, fraught questions in, in terms that CST provides, is that you can get a conversation going about things that matter to everybody at your institution. 
Um, so, and it happens to be a conversation that's drawing on this rich Catholic tradition. That's great. Um, it's a conversation in which everybody can participate, uh, to which everybody can contribute. Um, and it so happens that CST raises and frames questions that everybody's going to want to talk about. That's a great advantage for, for CST. It's a great benefit. It's a great resource for us at our institutions. And that's, you know, our, our project is intending to uh, support and facilitate and, and uh, you know, give further substance to those conversations. All right, Jennifer, that was the best I could do. Please. <laughs> I think that was excellent. Thank you. Well, gosh. Thank you both. Michael, did you have a thought on that? That there's a lot there. I'm thinking of an analogy to uh, what is in Laudato Si and, and as you, you, you know, when you look into the literature on environmental ethics, it's, it's a common refrain how we need an environment, we need an ecological conversion. We need an environmental conversion. So there's this common sense that, you know, our, the large motor engine of our economy and of our politics are really moving in a very catastrophic dimension. And the change is so fundamental to, that we need to do to, to, to counter that. We have to go really inside of ourselves and have a, have a conversion. And, and I think the same applies in Roman Catholic social thought. And I guess it goes back to my point. There needs to be a conversion to community. And, and um, you know, short of that, um, it's principles that are interesting to talk about. And you can, I think we're, we need a conversion to community and then it comes alive. Okay. Uh, you know, we, th these 75 minutes have expired rather quickly. I have one more question, but I wanna, I wanna kind of respond to you, to you, Michael, Jennifer and Bernard just as a director's privilege, I guess, because I, I wrote down to some notes before, you know, this last couple of weeks and thinking about uh, CST as anchor. Well, as opposed to what other anchors might there be at Catholic colleges? Uh, you know, CST is a very active, um, it's, it might be uh, a category of ethics or action for some scholars. And, but what about these other uh, enterprises on campus? The center of our campuses have chapels on them. And I think Mike, you're really talking about this because you, you mentioned conversion, you mentioned uh, retreating, retreat and thinking and praying. So, you know, how, what about lit, liturgical life, the life of faith, the life of prayer uh, as a, another wing on this bird, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that seems to be uh, falling off. These numbers are falling off in some ways. Uh, do, you know, how do we renew that life on campuses, how important is it to, to informing our, our efforts and strengthening us to, to be in, in the vineyard, in the world, uh, you know, working for justice and working for equity. So I just asked that as a rhetorical question, and I want to give you a practical question to close. So here's one from uh, Tim Hipskind or Hipskind, and pardon me, Tim, if I have it wrong, but he wants to look at this. Are, are there any studies that uh, to look at which universities have prioritized CST uh, versus measurable successes that can be used to argue that, that, that following CST is not merely idealistic, but can be a part of a well-discerned pedagogical strategy. Uh, Jennifer uh, alluded to an article by, by uh, Joe McCartan. Uh, are there other examples of these kind of practical studies uh, of, of, of fruit being uh, born of, 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 uh, of the tree? I'll just begin briefly. That's a great question. I'd love to see a comprehensive study of that. The only thing that I'm aware of is um, assessments of those universities who have divested from fossil fuels and reinvested in sustainable uh, energies. And the, the concern, of course, was they're going to lose a lot of money if they do this. And from what I've seen, they have not, and in fact, have done quite well. So that was their action in accord with Laudato Si and with other Catholic social thought on environmental sustainability and climate change. That's the only one I'm aware of. You all might know of others. Please, uh, Michael, you're, you're ready to go. Any thoughts from your vast experience in the field? 
You know, I'm going to take a pass on that one, Michael. I'm, um, I'm, I'm kind of chewing on it, and nothing ready is coming to mind. Okay, fair enough, Bernard. Uh, I'll just you know, point to one example, namely Dayton, which you know, um, even before Ladalto C, as we noted in our paper too, decided to divest from from fossil fuels, and has done well by itself. And Joe McCartan discusses Georgetown's just wage policy too. I don't know of any comprehensive study though, of initiatives that institutions have undertaken in accord with CST, whether um, deliberately or not. Mike, can can I speak though to your 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 uh, your your musing question? Please. Um, and I don't have too much to say, so maybe Jennifer, you, you'd like to say a little bit more. Um, I mean, for sure, there are other anchors, and we mean CST if we're to use that metaphor of anchor again as only one anchor among others, right? So we propose that it's an anchor for Catholic colleges and universities as an anchor that might um, you know, be of interest in particular to staff and faculty that might make some difference for boards. Um, you know, we, we began, you know, maybe somewhat cynically by, by saying that CST often figures as a cudgel. Well, it does. It's generally instrumentalized. It's generally used by faculty against administration, by administration against faculty. It can be so much more than that. It can do so much more than that for our institutions. Uh, do we need other anchors, so to speak, if we're to use that metaphor? Yes, right? Uh, as more and more students come to us who you know, don't identify with a religious tradition, in other words, it's more and more nuns, N-O-N-E-S, come to us. Well, we really need to think deeply about the spiritual needs of those students, right? How those students are, are to be served and, and, to de and develop spiritually. And CST is not, not the answer to that question. Jennifer? I agree. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that, that's very well said, and I appreciate that. I think maybe CST could be a meeting place for people who are unchurched or don't have the, the background. That's hopeful. And it's so rich, as you say. And maybe when you come in that door, you, you, you begin to, to be more curious about um, what informs it. Uh, and, and then you maybe take the time. My, so let's just do one uh, last word for people. And we'll start with our respondent. Mike, give just a final uh, a, a, a word of good night to our group. Uh, this has been a pleasure. I, um, you know, like I said, just just taking their uh, Jennifer and and um, uh, Bernard's work and uh, just letting it play. Uh, I appreciate that, and I, I I really appreciate your passion on this question. I think Catholic social teaching um, will be what remain if if Catholic if Catholic colleges and universities remain uh, over time. Um, it's going to be that dis that that experiential distillate of the, of community read through the Eucharist, read through the Catholic experience of God. Um, that, you know that'll that'll be what's left, and 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 the big ones will go their way, and and the kind of the, the kind of the little ones will. Go. So I I do think Catholic social teaching is um, whatever more metaphor you use, that's going to be there. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. What do you think, Bernard? Final word. I think, thank you for hosting us, Mike, and thank you for all your, your questions. And and I, I want to um, encourage people to come here. Laura Nichols, I see you on TV, Laura. So <laughs> Laura's a future speaker, and I think Catherine is still with us. So there's a lot more to learn from uh, these other people, and I'm really looking forward to those talks as well. Thanks, Mike, for hosting this whole series. It's Thank really you, helpful. Bernard. Thank oh, you. Sorry. Congrats on your book. Thank you, Bernard. Jennifer, please, what's your uh, your word of good night to our, our community? Oh, I want to express my gratitude to the Hank Center, to all of you for participating. It's, it's really hopeful that so many people are interested in engaging in this conversation. I feel, Mike, that your response is going to help us to improve this book. So thank you very much for that. Okay, well, let's put it together for our guests. And thanks so much to everybody for tuning in. I think I'll give you the chord of C as we say goodnight. So here we go. Oops. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Everybody. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Good night. <laughs>